Alors qu'il est né en France, le post-structuralisme ou post-modernisme, comme il a été nommé après l'ouvrage célèbre de François Lyotard, a sans doute connu son plus franc succès aux états unis où il est devenu l'un des courants intellectuels les plus prisés sur les campus universitaires. Un moment important de son développement aura été l'adoption par des poids lourds du département de littérature de la très prestigieuse université de Yale, des idées de la déconstruction développées par Jacques Derrida. C'est Paul de Man, un critique littéraire belge, qui peut être crédité pour la popularisation de Derrida aux états unis Avec mon invité David Lehman, nous discutons de la vie de Paul de Man, des révélations sur son passé ayant eu lieu après sa mort, et des réactions à ces révélations dans les milieux académiques. While initially developed in France, post-structuralism or post-modernism, as it became known after the famous book written by François Lyotard, has arguably enjoyed its greatest successes in the United States, where it became a leading intellectual framework on university campuses. An important moment in this story was the adoption by big names in the literature department of the very prestigious Yale University of the idea of deconstruction developed by Jacques Derrida. It is Paul de Man, a Belgian literary critic, who can be credited for the popularization of Derrida in America. With my guest David Lehmann, we talk about the life of Paul de Man, about the revelations about his past that emerged after his death, and about the reactions to these revelations in academia. Okay, so I'm thrilled to be here with Dr. David Lehmann. Uh, Dr. Lehmann, you're a literary critic, an associate professor of writing at the New School in New York. You have published 10 poem collections since 1986. You are the editor of the Best American Poetry series. Uh, you have also published seven prose books, including in 1991, uh, Signs of the Times, Deconstruction and the Fall of Paul de Man. And this is the book about which I wanted to talk to you. So could you first of all explain who Paul de Man was as an academic? I mean, who was he in the eyes of his... Uh, colleagues and disciples in the universities? Well, uh, before I uh, respond to that, may I just say that uh, while I am a literary critic, I would describe myself as, as a poet and writer uh -huh. and editor uh, for most, as a, as a poet and author and editor. Uh, and uh, so I... Um, My credentials as a literary scholar are in, are in order, and I can tell you the uh, I can speak on the on the subject at hand with some authority. Uh, Paul de Man was uh, a very respected and distinguished professor of literature at, at Yale University. Uh, he was universally, it seemed, admired and respected by his students and his colleagues. He was also the closest American academic to Jacques Derrida, and in fact was the foremost literary critic in advocating deconstruction and applying it to literary criticism. So uh, he was a fundamentally important figure in the transition of the study of English from practical criticism and uh, new criticism with its emphasis on, on the text as a trove of meanings to uh, a literary theory where the text is often subordinate to, to theory about the text and where suddenly texts seem to be full of problems rather than full of meaning. Uh, Daman was uh, a very successful proponent of of deconstruction, of Derrida's views. And he, on his death in 1983, had a very commanding position in academic studies in the United States. About four years later, after his death, uh, evidence was revealed to, to show that uh, Daman, as a young man in his native Belgium, had written nearly 200 articles for Nazi-run newspapers in Belgium during World War II. This revelation came as great shock to Demand's admirers and defenders 
because how could they uh, reconcile the idea of a, of a Nazi with their image of Paul Deman? On the other hand, there were people who looked at the disclosures and wondered if in some way uh, they were implicated in, in the man's career as a, as a professor and as a writer. Uh, what I mean to say is that uh, Deman had never acknowledged publicly what had happened to him as a, as a young man. In fact, he dissembled and, and lied about it. And the more that investigating that was done, the more one found out what a cad he had been, what a, what a louse, how he would not pay his uh, uh, creditors or his landlord or how, in fact, he was uh, uh, guilty of bigamy because he married a, a second wife without divorcing his first wife. There are a lot of dark secrets in that man's past. He, he never acknowledged them. But it, it, one subject that he investigated with great scholarly interest was that of confession. What is the status of confession? And he put a lot of energy into the idea that confession was a bankrupt mode of writing because there was no way to guarantee that the confessor was telling the truth and that this was a problem in, in, in language itself and there follows a deconstructive reasoning about how language has lost its contact with meaning or with reality. And this is a suspicious line of of thinking if uh, if the man has uh, a past of which he is perhaps ashamed and uh, it becomes very self uh, advantageous mm -hmm. to argue that confession is a bankrupt form or a bankrupt mode. Mm -hmm. That's a little introduction to Paul Deman. I've spoken for a, for longer than I should have. No, no, it's very good. Um, okay, so in in this case, I mean, so in this context, he was um, a big name in uh, literary theory in American in American universities in the nineteen eighties. So you've briefly mentioned this point, but maybe you can elaborate. Uh, my my question being, how did people in academia react? I mean, you've mentioned disbelief, but what exactly uh, did people say and do? Uh, well, it must be uh, noted that Yale, where he taught, was considered the finest English department in the United States at the time. Uh, Columbia had once held that distinction. And that uh, Deman was professionally recognized. Uh, that is, essays written in the scholarly journals would have more citations of Derrida and Deman than of any other uh, figure. Um, in the uh, aftermath of the disclosures, which were quite scandalous, uh, the people who in academe were, first of all, shocked, second of all, outraged. Uh, there was a lot of bewilderment and wonderment at how it was possible for someone to have escaped notice of his entire past. What did this say about him? What did this say about us and our a uh, view of history or our gullibility as Americans. Uh, the outrage was also that um, someone had kept this a secret besides Demond because he'd had that, this very extremely distinguished and lucky academic career that took him from Harvard to Cornell to Yale. Now, a lot of people felt um, disappointed, uh, even perhaps betrayed. And then there were many people who did not know Deman, but who vehemently disapprove of uh, Nazism and also were perhaps suspicious of deconstruction and of literary theory in general. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I was one of the first journalists to write about this uh, for a, a large circulation weekly. Newsweek magazine. And then I, I did another piece in the Los Angeles Times. So I found myself um, 
involved intellectually and emotionally, but also I was attacked um, quite regularly and hyperbolically by embattled deconstructionists. Um, I, I don't think I'd ever written anything before that had uh, aroused so violent a reaction on the part of a, of a sect. But this, this catapulted me into the action in a way because, I, because this uh, uh, whole event is an event in intellectual history having to do with speaking. And, uh, and so I, was, I found myself in debate and in dispute. And I also found myself wanting to write a book about it. Mm -hmm. uh, people in American universities uh, could talk of little else in the mm -hmm. aftermath of the uh, revelations. Okay. It was, in my view at the time, it was the most uh, singular and important uh, scandal to happen in academe in the, in the decade. Okay. So... In particular, there was one other figure beside Paul de Man, and you've mentioned him already several times, uh, who owed quite a bit of his influence on American campuses uh, to de Man, which is uh, Jacques Derrida, of course. So Derrida defended de Man quite ferociously, uh, among others by writing his book Memoir for Paul de Man, published in 1986. Um, How did Derrida construct his defense of Paul de Man in the face of the revelations? Derrida's defense of de Man surprised, even astonished me, because uh, he could have said, as some did, I repudiate what de Man did then, but that has no bearing on what he has done since. That was a line that he could well have taken, but he did not. He argued that in the most viciously anti-Semitic article of the nearly 200 that uh, uh, demanded had written in Belgium, uh, that the article s seemed to be saying that uh, uh, if you banished all the Jews from Europe, you would lose nothing. Mm -hmm. But that he, Derrida, had read the article very closely and construed it to be a criticism of the very thing that uh, he was advocating. That, it, that the language in the text had somehow subverted itself deliberately by demand, which is uh, a very funny line of argument because what it does is applies deconstruction methods to a very simple article that was like an op-ed piece in today's uh, New York Times or Washington Post, an article that was very easy to grasp. It was not a very difficult passage in Plato or Montaigne or Rousseau. Uh, it was just a, a short newspaper article that anyone could read for himself. And if you saw that uh, Derrida was twisting things around to make it look like day was night, and uh, black was white, uh, I think then you, you had an extra suspicion of deconstruction. So he fell into a trap of his own making in a, in a way. The article he wrote, I think it was called Like a Storm Inside a Seashell. Mm -hmm. And there were written six, they were published in the same journal, six responses, uh, five of which took uh, issue with Derrida and were uh, outraged that he was defending uh, an, a Nazi statement, a statement of the ideology of national socialism. This is hard to forgive. Uh, I don't think it was doing his theories a, a service. Mm -hmm. So on, on that very point, actually, Um, what would you say that this whole episode, so both um, what people learned about the past of Paul de Man and also the reaction of Jacques Derrida, what would you say that these facts tell us, if anything, about 
the literary theory of deconstruction because um, there seem to be some concepts in the theory of deconstruction that play a role in in these facts. I mean, you've you've mentioned uh, Paul de Man's uh, attack on the idea of uh, confession. There was also um, the attack on the idea that the um, the identity of the author matters to uh, the understanding of a text, and also you could say more broadly the general idea of um, truth and in this case, historical truth was under attack by deconstruction. So would you say that this episode was sort of an illustration of the problems of the theory or something entirely different? Or maybe that it does not uh, tell us anything about deconstruction in practice, if you will. Well, that was uh, very well stated. I, I do think that the episode and its aftermath uh, does constitute a uh, illustration of the problem of this particular literary theory. And in fact, I think the narrow uh, deconstruction in the narrow sense of what uh, Daman was doing with the text is no longer fashionable. Uh, no longer nearly as fashionable as it was. Other things have taken uh, the fore in uh, the study of literature. But at the same time, I think that we've failed to grasp the meaning of that lesson because many of the deconstructionist ideas that were advanced uh, back in 35 years ago, have seemed to be uh, assimilated in the culture in some ways. There's a disregard for truth, some would say, among political leaders, where inconsistencies abound. And the remarkable thing is not that uh, political figures dissemble, it's that they may be doing so, so... Uh, openly, so, so brazenly, with evidence of the uh, untruth available readily. Well, what, what this says something about the nature of, of truth in, uh, in life, how, I, in a sense, we, I think we have devalued that. Uh, this seems to me consistent with a deconstructionist view of things, uh, which I, I think is very destructive. You know, it's, it used to be said that the uh, skeptic and extreme skepticism uh, was a, uh, a dilemma, uh, a threat, but uh, on uh, an epistemological level. Mm -hmm. But it could be argued now that it's a threat on the uh, uh, as uh, existentially. Mm -hmm. That is to say that uh, the Skeptics' annihilation of the world uh, is is a real possibility. It seems. Well, that's pushing the argument to its uh, furthest extent. Uh, <clears throat> certain deconstructionist practices, for example, regarding the world as a set of binary opposites, and then suggesting that it would be wise and fruitful to flip or reverse the status uh, relative of the two uh, opposites. So, so divide anything into two, male, female, white, black, and so on. Uh, truth, lie. When you break things down that way, cause and effect, you, uh, you're, you're uh, doing something that's a little dangerous, I think. Mm -hmm. especially in reality. I mean, one, one thing that uh, occurs to me is that in, in art, in writing, one may want a sort of deconstructive logic because it's, uh, it is very interesting to work with in an artifact. But there is a difference between art and, and life. Mm -hmm. But I mean, s some people might argue that there has always been, you know, part of the human 
not condition, so to say, is to, to have an impulse to um, disregard truth whenever um, convenient. Um, so some people might argue that um, if you can identify this trend, perhaps more saliently in, in, in recent times, uh, it doesn't prove in any way that, um, you know, deconstruction and attending philosophies has had, sorry, anything to do with that, with this trend. I don't know if you understood my question. No, I'm, I'm not sure I did. Okay, so let me try and repeat it. I mean, in as much as one would be able to identify a recent trend in disregarding truth, um, how would one go about to to show, to prove that deconstruction and it, its influence in universities and in culture had anything to do with that trend? Uh, how would one make that argument? Mm -hmm. uh, I think what one could make that argument, I think you'd have to invest some time in, in, in showing the relation of how the shibboleths of higher education have anticipated the changes of culture in, in the United States mm -hmm. and I think in the Western civilized world. Uh, I think there's been a, a tremendous uh, uh, shift intellectually and also in, in fashion and in every conceivable way. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, you mentioned the death of the author, yeah. which is a um, a view of that the uh, deconstructionists like to advance, uh, starting uh, with uh, Roland Barthes' uh, argument to that, his pronouncement that the author is dead, uh, which gives you the permission to read anything as you wish without regard to the intentions and uh, aims of the author. Well, uh, I think this is a very dangerous idea because while we might want to read some texts on their own, surely it is important to us how the author feels about it. Why do we read the letters of authors? Why do we read the diaries of writers? Well. One of the interesting things is that the uh, deconstructionists themselves have their names on their books. And uh, Derrida, when uh, attacked by these five critics I mentioned earlier who were responding to his uh, article uh, on Demand, when attacked, he said, um, he was saying, no, you didn't understand me at all. This is what I meant. So um, in his own practice, mm -hmm. with regard to his own writing, he completely violated the basic precepts for which he stood. Yeah. So there was either hypocrisy going on or there was a, a failure of thought. Mm -hmm. Perhaps a combination of the two. Mm -hmm. The idea that the self is exempted from the theories that one espouses is an interesting one. It, it speaks to the ego of the, of the uh, man who's thinking that. Yeah, indeed. So since you brought things back to um, Derrida, uh, I wanted to ask you this question. I know we've already briefly discussed that through email, but uh, maybe you would like to elaborate for our listeners. So... Um, in the, 19, uh, in the 1990s, excuse me, Derrida underwent what we could call a Marxist turn, uh, as shown among others by his 1994 book, Spectres of Marx. Uh, and it has uh, often been noticed that Derrida turned to Marx very late, when many other intellectuals were leaving Marx behind to some extent. Um, probably much of this could be pinned on Derrida's anti-conformism, which is very famous, but I have crafted this, uh, this hypothesis. So uh, in the 1980s, Derrida had to face the revelations about the Nazi past. The Nazi past of Martin Heidegger was clearly one, one of his most central influences. 
and uh, just a few years later, really, uh, the uh, the revelations about the collaborationist past of Paul de Man, who was one of his uh, closest colleagues and disciples uh, in American universities. So my hypothesis is that perhaps Derrida felt that his uh, left-wing credentials, which are often very important in academia, were waning and crumbling uh, because of those revelations about figures that were very close to him intellectually, and uh, that he felt the urge, or at least he had the idea, to start writing about Karl Marx to recover some leftist credibility. Well, I think it's a very interesting hypothesis, and I think that you could uh, uh, argue that case very persuasively, uh, especially since you do acknowledge that uh, there is a streak of anti-conformism in Derrida, a perversity, so that he may pick up something that other people are, are dropping. But I, I do think that he felt vulnerable to these charges because Heidegger and Deman were two instances, uh, one of whom is extremely close to him personally. And uh, so I, I think perhaps he wanted to bolster his left-wing credentials, which, as you say, are very important in higher education. Uh, I wanted to ask you whether you thought, uh, in your own experience, whether um, uh, Derrida is uh, as influential and as much read and cited today as was the case 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, I can actually speak from experience because I'm, I'm not an expert in literary theory by any means, but certainly from what I've heard, uh, it's not the case that he's equally cited as he was like in the 1980s. But my sort of slightly longer answer to that would be that um, his ideas are still extremely relevant to what can can happen in academia in some fields such as uh, still literature, but also gender studies, this type of thing. So even though people do not cite him directly, they cite people who he has influenced, like Judith Butler, uh, among, you know, countless other instances. So I would say that, you know, he has really... Um, well, his influence remains intact, I would say, although less directly, probably. But uh, that's, yeah, that's, my, that's my answer. I think that's a, a good answer. Mm -hmm. every, uh, every part of me, uh, by instinct, rebels against uh, Derrida and Judith Butler and that very impulse uh, I, I feel is deeply pernicious. Now I say I, I feel that. So uh, 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 thinking is, is one thing and feeling is, is another. But when one does have instincts, in addition to the arguments that one makes, it may even be argued that, uh, that the one precedes the other. Mm -hmm. Well, possibly. So I have a final question for you, and this is one um, around which we've been dancing, I would say, in the final few minutes, I mean, in the past few minutes, because um, I wonder about um, what you would say the legacy of Paul de Man today is in the circles that he influenced back in the day, so especially American academia. And um, so my, my guess would be that... Um, well, it's, it's, it's less a guess than really uh, my personal answer, I would say, but that his influence, uh, as well as that of his colleagues, such as Derrida, of course, can be felt still very strongly in American universities when you hear about maybe not deconstruction anymore, but maybe these days about deprivileging and decolonizing. Um, these are processes that seem to operate very much along the same lines as deconstruction construction might have done back in the days. Uh, I agree. Mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, Demand's particular influence uh, is, is, is one thing. The influence of, his, uh, of his, his reputation is something else. I'm not sure how many people are reading Paul Demand or 
applying demands ideas of uh, textual interpretation to their own interpretative uh, methods. And furthermore, Demand uh, was a uh, someone who, who believed in a canon of great works, which is not a view that uh, prevails, mm -hmm. uh, with some exceptions. Uh, but as you say, the uh, the various trends that you can point to in higher education seem to me to be. Uh, evidence of uh, il illustrations of the same kind of mindset that uh, deconstruction introduced. It's also the assumption that things as, as they are need to be upset. That mm -hmm. the, the, the idea that the approach should uh, subvert or destroy the thing that is studied mm -hmm. implies that the thing that is studied is fatally flawed, unhealthy, diseased mm -hmm. even. <clears throat> and uh, that's a very dangerous attitude if you are going to apply it not only to a text, but to the world. It being a deconstructive notion that the world itself is a text. Yeah. That raises interpretation to a tremendous level and reduces the need for evidentiary explication. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's very, very dangerous. Uh, I'm not alone in thinking that way, but uh, higher education in, in America is, uh, you know, they talk about uh, political correctness, but I, I'm not sure that's, that's quite the right term for uh, orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. there's, there's an orthodoxy, and um, it, is, it is very total. Uh, I think that you have to toe the line on certain matters, not just incidental matters of taste, not just which author should be studied uh, in depth, not just Thomas Mann rather than, uh, rather than uh, Herman Hess. Mm -hmm. it, it's not a, a simple matter of, uh, you know, a, a value judgment on a local level, but it's uh, uh, much, much greater than that. You, you have uh, attitudes that you are supposed to hold in, in common. So you have the spectacle of lecturers or speakers brought into college or university campuses whose point of view differs from the orthodoxy. And there is an almost violent reaction either on the part of students, faculty, or both uh, abetted by agitators, which mm -hmm. is always possible. Um, that's a very disheartening for anyone who believes in civil discourse. Yeah. Do, do you have this problem in, in Germany? Um, well, I'm not in a university right now. I work in a research institute, and uh, of course I should also add, I think it's even more important the fact that in the natural sciences, we are usually very far removed from such um, worries, so to say. Well, yes, but there, there was that so-called hoax. There uh, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there was. I mean, it was uh, before my time, so to say, but uh, I've educated myself on that um, in the meantime. But I mean, Sokal was not, you know, um, criticizing fellow physicists. He was criticizing oh. um, literary theorists and philosophers and this type of, well, people in those disciplines. So, um, yeah, I mean, well, there might be some trends um, with science having some, some problem. Uh, you know, scientists having some trouble carrying out research because of uh, orthodoxy, as you put it. Um, but probably biology would be more uh, endangered than physics in this case, much more so, I would say. Well, <clears throat> that's very interesting because uh, I, I think an another uh, old conflict or episode of intellectual history that bears upon the present moment is the uh, uh, conflict of uh, F.R. Leavis and C.P. Snow in the mm -hmm. early 1960s. Snow 
in Britain felt that the world intellectually was divided into scientists and humanists and that mm -hmm. the scientists had the future in their bones and they were going to win the, f the future. Now, Levis was, uh, was a uh, controversialist and uh, uh, a polemicist with very deeply felt views. He was outraged and uh, delivered a lecture attacking uh, C.P. Snow, giving no quarter. Um, it, whatever you think of the debaters then, it is very interesting now, uh, more than 50 years later, to, to determine uh, whether, in fact, the sciences are the privileged part of the universities. Uh, many of us feel that that's likely the case and that computer technology makes it even dramatically more so. I know that at Cornell University, uh, there's a great big new technology uh, division that's going to be in New York City. And there are many on the, on the campus who are very uh, envious of, uh, uh, of the new facility and the funds that are going there. And uh, maybe there's always a battle in, in, in budgetary terms but I think the humanists today are more uh, have more problems than they did 50 years ago when they could argue mm -hmm. and did argue that the reading of the great books mm -hmm. was fundamental yeah. to education and could be the basis for an adult life in uh, a variety of professions. That's a, a, a coherent view of mm -hmm. uh, education. I'm not sure you get that uh, today. You get a adversarial, uh, the institutionalizing of an adversarial uh, uh, action toward uh, adversarial relation to to the society as a as a whole. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, it, it's. I think it's very troubling. Because uh, you've introduced uh, deconstruction, seems to me to be in a way a very cynical idea. Mm -hmm. That is, it, it assumes the, the basis. Often in practice, the deconstructionists assume the most uh, uh, the narrow self-interest on the part of of an author. They assume the worst in human. Behavior. Yeah. That is something very cynical about that. There's a literary theorist named Stanley Fish uh -huh. who said that his profession doesn't oblige him to speak truthfully. It yes. merely obliges him to speak in, in an interesting way, to mm -hmm. say something interesting. Well, I, I think that you've uh, you've got a real problem on your hands when you when you think that because you're going to be replacing truth and wisdom with showmanship okay well that, this was my my last question but i don't know if you wanted to ask to add excuse me um, i just wanted to ask you, know, uh, you do you do you uh have you read marx marx no i haven't read him no oh, you haven't no so what drew your interest in derrida and mm. deconstruction as an intellectual subject yes well, uh, uh, it, it was when I learned about the circle affair, actually. Ah. Yes, I learned about it only a few years ago, you know, even though I was um, already an advanced student in physics. I hadn't heard about it until I was halfway through my PhD. Um, so I read the book by Alan Sokal and Jean Bricmont, and this was really, you know, the beginning of the journey down the rabbit hole for me. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah. So this is, thanks a lot for agreeing to do this. I had a lot of fun. Uh, I really enjoyed reading your book. This was uh, a year and a half ago now. Really a good book. I must say, I, I'm not sure I even had heard of Balderman before hearing about your book. But um, yeah, very interesting, especially for someone who wanted to know more about Derrida like me. I'm very glad you like my book. Mm -hmm. Thank you for inviting me to join you in conversation. Yeah. Well, my pleasure. Thanks for agreeing to do that. Merci. <laughs> Je vous en prie. À la prochaine. Très bien. À la prochaine. Bonne journée. Vous la même.